Well, good morning and welcome to Calvary Church. My name is Dave Ross. Let's stand together now as we sing to our great Savior, the Lion and the Lamb. Let's lift him up and praise his name. Well, good morning, everyone. Please, please have a seat. Uh, good morning. It's good to see everyone this morning. My name is Bo Eckert, the senior pastor here at Calvary Church, and I want to welcome you. Glad that you're here. Glad that you're spending part of your Memorial Day weekend with us, whether you're here in the auditorium joining us on our live stream or listening by radio. Lots of ways to connect. We're glad that you've chosen to do one of those and be with us here this morning. 
If you're new to Calvary Church, we'd love to be able to connect with you uh, more than what we can do in this environment. And we can do that in what we call a welcome gathering. It takes place immediately after this service ends out the back doors of the auditorium. Head down to your right. There's a room with a sign that says welcome gathering. And I make my way back there. There's some other staff and volunteers that are there. Answer any questions that you might have. Help you to understand what your next steps might be here at Calvary Church. And just a way to, to welcome and connect with you and help this big church to feel a little bit more like a family. And I don't know what the rest of your plans are today, but as always, lunch is served right after this service. So uh, that's another great way to connect in smaller groups uh, around the lunch table uh, and, and spend that time together. So join us for lunch today uh, if that fits in with your plans. Now, just one uh, housekeeping uh, issue that I need to address here this morning. For those of you that have a My Calvary account uh, here at the church, uh, our online directory, online giving, uh, children's ministry check-in, you've been receiving emails about some changes that are coming there, and they go into effect next Sunday, June 3rd. Uh, so if you have questions about that, if you have questions about the emails that you've been getting, um, there's some information in the bulletin this morning in the Did You Know section, and you can always stop by either of the connection centers um, to, to get your questions answered there. Uh, so our new check-in system for children's ministry will begin next Sunday. Um, besides that, there's also other information that we have for you in the bulletin. We put that in your hand each and every Sunday, important information in there. Live Sent elective on how to effectively share your faith is coming up for those that are interested in that. Another section that's in the bulletin that I uh, want to draw your attention to, there's a praying uh, section in there where we put uh, names of folks that are in the hospital and people that have lost loved ones. And uh, just recently we've had two staff members that have lost loved ones. Uh, Ricky Batts, who's part of our uh, facility staff, his sister-in-law passed away. And John Fry, our pastor of worship ministries, uh, his mother uh, passed away and he's uh, taking care of the details, getting ready for, uh, for that service there. So we want to continue to pray for, for Ricky and for John and their families uh, and for others uh, that have uh, recently lost loved ones. And speaking of remembering, um, as I mentioned, it is Memorial Day weekend. And I think there's something in us, something that God has put in us that we want to remember I have a picture of my grandfather who served as a Marine in World War II in the Pacific. I have a picture of him in uniform on my desk here in my office because I just want to remember him and remember his service uh, to our country and remember who uh, he was as a person. But when we think about what we are remembering, it's more than just memories on Memorial Day. It's remembering individuals who gave their life for a cause that was greater than themselves. And so just another way of saying remembering is to say, let's make sure we never forget. So let's watch the screens together. They are more than just names more than blocks of stone set in rows, more than memories. They are our brothers and sisters, our parents and our children. Friends, loved ones, and even strangers who believe that we were worth fighting for, that we were worth dying for, they stand for justice, for courage, for heroism and fearlessness in the face of danger. They stand for the brave men and women who selflessly answered the call and gave their very lives for the cause of freedom. Let us never take their sacrifice for granted, but instead, Remember with gratitude those who have served. Today, tomorrow, and every day thereafter. By the grace of God, if we walk upon free soil, if we breathe in the sweetness of liberty, 
Let us give thanks. Let us honor the fallen. And let us never forget. As a way of honoring those that paid that ultimate sacrifice, I'm going to pray. But as I pray, I want to invite those of you that are able to stand with me um, as I pray. So if you're able, please stand as we pray and honor those that gave their life this Memorial Day weekend. Father, our hearts are humbled this morning as we think about service and sacrifice and the loss of life. Memorial Day gives us the chance to pause and to think of those individuals, those individuals that gave the last measure of full devotion for their country, to remember those that laid so costly a sacrifice on the altar of freedom. They were individuals with unique stories so different from one another, yet at the same time so much alike. Today, we pause to remember. We grieve, we mourn, we give thanks. We ask that you would bring comfort and love and peace to their families and friends that only can come from you. So today and every day, we honor the fallen, and we will never forget their sacrifice. And Father, as we think about remembering their sacrifice, we can't help but lift our eyes and our hearts to the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus, who you sent to give his life for all of us, for the sins of the whole world. May the life-changing message of his gospel penetrate hearts and lives all over this country and all over the world. The gospel brings ultimate freedom. The gospel makes us a child of God. Thank you that your grace runs deep. And in the message of the gospel, I am who you say I am. Unite us around that message and that truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much. You may be seated. And as you are, I'm going to invite our ushers to come as we receive our offering as we continue to sing and worship together.
Let's stand together and sing, I'm chosen, not forsaken. Proclaim, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Sing that again. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free, oh, it's free. Just continue to worship together. Lift up the name of Christ Jesus. Proclaim to him that he is all we need. Christ is my reward and all of my devotion. Now there's nothing world that could ever satisfy through every trial my soul will sin no turning back I've been set free I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back, no turning back. Christ
Amen. We can clap for our Savior. You know, a lot of times we can sing words like that, that Christ is enough and nothing else satisfied and everything we need is in Him and, and we believe that and yet at times our hearts betray us and we find that sometimes we feel that we cherish Jesus and something else or we find that we are trusting Jesus and maybe something else for our righteousness, maybe our works. And Paul, the apostle, knew this tendency that we have, and he spoke directly to the Philippian people and said, after listing a list of reasons why he could say on his own merit he's righteous, and he said, I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Jesus Christ has done. He calls it garbage. Everything we could do, anything else that we might cherish besides Jesus is garbage. And so that's why it's so important that we sing together words to affirm that nothing else satisfies, to affirm that Jesus is all we need. And so as we continue to sing, let's continue to sing and proclaim together that He is our vision, He is our wisdom, and He should be the King of our hearts. for uh, seeking us and finding us in our brokenness, Lord. Um, thank you so much for giving us the reminder that nothing in this world can satisfy except your love, Lord. Um, Lord, I pray that not only today, but every day we would follow after you. And thank you for finding us, Lord. Amen. You may have a seat.
Good morning, friends, and happy Memorial Day to you. I hope you're going to spend it with uh, friends and people you love. Today, we have another exciting and I think very essential episode in the one story. For those of you who might be new today or recently, we're working through the one story of the Bible. It's taken some time. We're about two-thirds of the way through, and today we end the Old Testament. And uh, it's an important episode because you want to know how this episode bridges to the New Testament uh, and Jesus Christ beginning next week. Uh, if you've missed previous episodes or you want to know more about the one story, uh, browse around in the overlook area of the lobby, and there are a number of aids there for you. If Neil Diamond was writing songs and performing them in the Middle East in the 6th century B.C., by the way, Neil Diamond is Jewish, so it's not unlandish to think that he might be doing something like that. I think one of the songs that would have hit the top of the charts is this one. Far, we've been traveling far, we're coming to Jerusalem. We're coming to Jerusalem. Bum, bum, bum. We're coming to Jerusalem today, or something like that. It would have been something similar. No, no, no. Don't try to launch me into a new career. Uh, it's too late, too late for that. Uh, that was last week. We're in season three. We're going from the great nation to Jesus Christ, but in between there's quite a dip. As a matter of fact, it's not a dip. The bottom fell out. Israel was exiled from the land that God gave to them, and it was their own fault for disobeying God. And then last week we heard that God had a remnant return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, rebuild the city walls, not quite as great as it was under Solomon, but nevertheless, a remnant was there. A remnant had returned. But the vast majority of Jews remained in the nations to which they were scattered. The rest remained. Who cares? I think we should care, because without understanding what was going on with the rest, we're not going to understand very much about what God is doing to push the one story forward. Well, who was the rest? What were they like? First of all, according to the nations to which they went, they were interlopers. They were intruders that didn't belong. They were immigrants. They were the ones at the lowest level of the economic ladder. If not slaves, they did menial work. Uh, they huddled together in the poorest areas. The word ghetto wasn't coined until the medieval period, but it was the Jews living in Venice, Italy, but this was a very ghetto-like experience that they had in the nations. They were called names. They stood out as being odd. They admittedly, according to the customs of that day, they acted funny. So they were outcasts and they were oddballs. And it isn't surprising that they would feel alone, displaced, and defeated. Matter of fact, that's been the history of the Jews in large part ever since. And uh, we know some of the disastrous consequences of this kind of wandering Jew life that's occurred since they were exiled to this very day. And by the way, when you see pictures of Orthodox Jews and they're wearing their black attire, uh, that's very intentional. They're in mourning. They're in mourning that they cannot do what God called them to do in the place where God called them to do it 
in Jerusalem. There's going to be another tragedy with respect to the temple that's coming later, but uh, this is where it began. So they were interlopers. But for the faith, they were innovators because they were forced to innovate. Here they were in a strange land. They didn't have the temple. They didn't have the places to sacrifice. They didn't have the priests doing all the things that they did that God prescribed in order that they establish and maintain this relationship with God. So what did they do? Well, they got together in synagogues, places of assembly, places of prayer, places to study, hoping that there was still a future for Israel. The last two verses in the book of Lamentations, you know, Jeremiah was lamenting that they were exiled from Jerusalem, and uh, these last two verses express a hope that they would be restored, but also the possibility that they wouldn't be. Lamentations 5, 21 and 22, restore us to yourself, O Lord, that we may be restored. This was their prayer. Renew our days as of old, unless you have utterly rejected us and you remain exceedingly angry with us. So this sense of is it all over hung over the Jews. But nevertheless, in these synagogues, what they did is they tried to simulate as best they could a right relationship with God. How did they do it? Well, they didn't have the Holy of Holies and the altar to set in the middle of the temple where God resided, but they had, shall we say, the next best thing? They had the Torah, the law, the scriptures on scrolls, and they kept it in a box in the center of the synagogue behind a very ornate curtain. And when you would step up to that box, you would be looking toward Jerusalem. That's the way it was oriented. And during this time in the synagogues, we have the rise of rabbis who taught and scribes who interpreted and preserved the law. And there was an oral tradition from generation to generation that was maintained. And that oral tradition eventually became written tradition, but it's commentary on the Scripture and then commentary on the commentary on the Scripture and commentary on the commentary on the commentary of the Scripture. You have the idea as they were working through what it is that God had said. So they were interlopers, they were innovators, and by the way, this idea of the synagogue is going to be very important and very prominent when we get into season four. From God's point of view, they were infiltrators. Infiltrators. Remember the promise to Abraham that began season two. Abraham, in you, all the nations will be blessed. It's not about you and your progeny, ultimately. It's about all the people of the whole world. That's where my interest is. That's where I'm going with this. That's who I love. That's who I'm reaching out to. But it looked that Israel, that became a nation, that was to be an example, was to be used to go to the nations. Now God dismantled them, and it looked like uh, it was going in the opposite direction. Until you look again, look more closely, and what do you find? You find that in scattering the Jews in the nations, what you have now are the people of God and the Word of God embedded in the nations. You could think of the Jews as God's secret agents and the synagogues as God's outposts in the nations. And generation after generation of Jew adopted the customs, learned the language of the nations, they intermarried, they took root in those cultures to be able to understand the cultures and communicate with the cultures while keeping their Jewish identity. Kind of neat, I would say, the way God takes something that looks rather negative and turns it into something that's going to become extremely positive as he moves the story forward. So this is an advance in the one story. I think we should look at it that way. And there are two books that help us to understand what God is doing at the end of the Old Testament in preparation of the coming of Christ. And those two books are Daniel and Esther. Daniel and Esther. 
They're alike in many ways and different in several ways. They're alike in that it's the Jews under the pagan rulers, and they're both in government, and they both find favor with the king. However, it didn't happen without great danger to the Jews because there was the potential of total extermination. And we also find that they faced hard choices, that they, have to, they had to uh, decide whether or not to serve the Lord or pull back. They're different in several ways. Of course, Daniel's a man, Esther's a woman. Daniel was uh, in Babylon in the 6th century B.C., Esther in Persia, the next world empire in the 5th century B.C. Daniel's faith was very public, whereas we'll see Esther's was hidden. In Daniel, you'll find a lot of miracles, but uh, none in Esther. It's just the providence of God at work. Daniel was a prophet. He's the last of the four prophets, but Esther, at least at the beginning of the story, is just a common Jewish girl, ordinary person. So let's take Daniel first and then Esther. What we find in Daniel, yes, you have uh, the king having dreams and the fiery furnace and the lion's den and the prophet having visions of things to come, and you might think of all of those in Daniel, and they're there. But the thing that stands out in Daniel, I think more than anything else, is that there are people of God in the nations whose faith is steadfastly placed on God. And Daniel was a standout of this, as well as his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood in that hostile environment, unapologetic and unbowed, even when it got tough. So they had faith in God. They had faith that God would guide them. Right at the beginning of Daniel, we read that he resolved that he was not going to defile himself. And that's maybe the first step in guidance. Don't be conformed to the world. We have a new allegiance, and God, I'm going to follow you. And Daniel and his companions did that. And then we also read that God gave them gifts, and they used those gifts. And for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom. And to Daniel, he specifically had understanding in all visions and dreams. And they were guided by God in that they had a gift, and they were resolved to exercise that gift for the glory of God. They took opportunities as they came to them. Uh, one opportunity was the king had a dream. His assistants couldn't figure it out. And Daniel, knowing the bigger picture, he stepped in and he interpreted that dream. But the interpretation of the dream had a little difficulty with it, at least respect to a, a king that he wanted to have a good relationship with because he had to tell the king, there's a king higher than you. And he talked about the Lord. He talked about the Lord openly to the king. And he said, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed, nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. It shall break in pieces all these kingdoms, the kingdoms of the world that precede it, and bring them to an end. And it, that is the kingdom of God, shall stand forever. And he said that to King Nebuchadnezzar, though uh, Nebuchadnezzar might not have wanted to hear it. They were also trusting in God's protection for them, but uh, in an interesting way, not that He would protect them at all costs, at least in the way in which we think of protection. Nebuchadnezzar, uh, as most kings of that day wa uh, were, he was rather uh, proud, and he, he set up a, a golden image of himself 90 feet tall. And he decreed that uh, you either bowed to the image or you burned. Bow or burn, simple choice. And the Jewish law says you don't bow to idols. So when everybody's bowing, there are some Babylonians looking at this group not bowing, and they happen to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had become leaders of a sort uh, at the time. 
And uh, that didn't sit well with them, so they told the king, and the king wasn't happy with it either. And he was furious, and he said, look, I said, bow or burn, you're about to burn. Who's going to save you? And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said something rather profound. Though they didn't know what the future was in that instance for them, this is what they said. If this be so, that is, king, if this be so, what you're saying, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us. We have total confidence that he can from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. How? They didn't know. But if not, if he chooses not to deliver us, if we are consumed by the fire, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. We don't know specifically what God is going to do. We know he can do it. We're asking him to do it, but if he doesn't do it, we know that and we trust in his protection of, it, of us ultimately. So whether in life or in death, he will protect us. That needs to be our attitude too. He's going to guide us. He's going to protect us. And we also have a healthy faith, I would hope, in God's sovereignty over things. He's the, he's the king of kings. He's the one who is over all, over all nations. It looked at this point in Israel's history that the bad guys were winning. But Daniel knew different. And in the last half of Daniel, we have these various visions. And this is one of the visions that he had from Daniel 7, verses 13 and 14. He said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. So he's looking ahead, he's thinking of God's rule over all the nations, and he says there, there's one coming like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So they had a faith in the sovereignty of God that he was the Lord of all and that uh, he has a plan and he's working out that plan. And they also had faith that, that he was working out that plan according to his timetable. They had faith in the sovereign God's timetable. In Daniel 9, we read about a period of time. It's called 70 weeks. He's likely talking about 70 weeks of years. Uh, and in those weeks, there's a certain kind of division that's taking place. But the overall impression is that Daniel believed, whether you can understand exactly what those periods of time were, that Daniel believed that God was guiding his plan. He was superintending his plan. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity. He says, I've got a timetable in place, and the end of transgression and iniquity, sin, that's coming to bring in an everlasting righteousness, and then an anointed one shall be cut off. That's the means by which that would happen. We're getting closer to the New Testament. We're getting greater clarity with respect to what's happening. So here we have in Daniel people who trust the Lord to guide them, to protect them, and also trust that He is the Lord of all, and His timing and His sovereignty over all nations is unquestioned. That's terrific, and we have that in Daniel. But when we move to Esther, we have a, a different feel, a different sense, a different atmosphere altogether, because what we find in Esther is a silent God, and I put silent in quotes here, uh, and you'll see why in just a moment. But Esther's a strange book in the Bible. No prophet is present, no scripture is quoted, no God is mentioned, no prayer is offered. Although there's fasting going on and there's Jewish identity which is being maintained. But we have no new 
speaking of God into a situation. We just have a story within the one story, a personal story, Esther's story. And uh, I think we need to think of Esther's story like we would think of our own story. He's silent in Esther, but he keeps speaking. How does he keep speaking? Well, he speaks through Mordecai. He speaks through the Jewish tradition. Even though the Word of God isn't there, the Word of God and the truth of God is active everywhere in the book of Esther. The prophet Isaiah said, Isaiah 55, 11, my word, that is speaking for God, will not return to me void. When it goes out, it will accomplish the purpose that I have for it. And uh, a Hebrew writer in the New Testament said it even, uh, I don't know if you'd say more clearly, but uh, certainly in a way that we can understand. As the Holy Spirit says, today if you hear His voice, do not harden your heart. The Holy Spirit says, present tense, and he's quoting a passage from Psalm 95, which was written a millennium before. Once God speaks, that word is alive. It keeps speaking. He's not saying something new, but what he said already has life and speaks and is totally sufficient. That's why he says a little bit later in uh, the book of Hebrews, for the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and marrow. In other words, it gets inside. It's sent out by God, and it just doesn't land with a thud. It digs in and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We sometimes get the impression, it's a wrong impression, to think that God is speaking throughout the whole of the one story. No, His speaking, that is new speaking, is rather episodic. To Abraham, He said, I will, the promise. In the law, He said, you shall, to Moses. At the time of David and Solomon, the Lord is my shepherd. He spoke in terms of human testimony and wisdom. And then through the prophets, he said, thus saith the Lord. At great redemptive events and turning points, God speaks. Well, what happens in between? Are those people without revelation? Of course not. It's all of what God said continues to speak. We live in that day. We don't have a loose-leaf Bible. The apostles brought the Word, and when that was over, now we have the sufficient Word of God about Jesus Christ that we live by, and we're waiting for something new in the future, which will come. But he, he keeps speaking today through His Word, and He kept speaking then to Esther in a way we'll, we'll see just now, because He not only kept speaking, He keeps working. He keeps working. What He says we have, and what he does is kind of known only to him. He works behind the scenes. He works providentially. He guides. We can speculate about it, but we can't know about it. He will take vessels of honor who trust him, vessels of dishonor who don't trust him, and he'll use them just as he used Israel in their exile as he's going to be using them for his good purposes. Silence doesn't mean that God is disinterested or, or He's not active. He, he's very active uh, in what He's doing, and we've got to trust that, just as Esther had to trust that in her life. When you think of the story of Esther as her story in the bigger one story, think of your own life as one story within the bigger story, and I think principles of God's providence will become clearer or clearer to you. Think about Esther for a second. Here's the story. I don't know how familiar you are with it, but I'll try to explain it in just a few words. The setting is Persia. We're at a banquet that's thrown by the king. The king, Ahas, Ahasuerus, who's also known as King Xerxes, X-E-R-X-E-S, uh, love that name. Uh, Xerxes, maybe you could name a pet uh, Xerxes. That would be a good name for a pet. Uh, but here he was, and he said, 
maybe he had a little bit too much to drink and he wanted Queen Vashti to parade uh, probably lewdly in, in front of his guests. And she said, not doing it. And he said, you're no longer the queen. And then he searched for a new queen. And it just so happened that he chose a young girl named Esther. Just so happened. If you read through the book of Esther, you'll come across, if not those words, that sentiment, just so happened, just so happened, just so happened. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. Just a story of happenings. You say, well, we look back and we can see the meaning. Yes, but while she was going through them, she didn't know, and we don't know the meaning behind them, but somebody is giving great meaning to it. It just so happened that uh, Queen Esther had an uncle named Mordecai, and it just so happened that Mordecai heard that there was a plot against the king, and he told Esther, Esther told the king, and Mordecai was raised to a level of prominence. Mordecai was a Jew, and it just so happened that Mordecai withheld the fact that Esther was also Jewish. Now, there's a villain in the story, and his name is Haman. And Haman was the king's right-hand man. And when he saw Mordecai being lifted up, he was green with envy. And he said, I've got to bring Mordecai down. And the way he decided to do it was with a little payola to the king. And he said, you know, this." people here who don't bow to you, same idea, they're following another law, they're not following your laws, uh, what I'd like to do is exterminate them. And the king said, attaboy, Haman, and it looked pretty bad. And Mordecai got word of this because the decree went out, and he went to Esther and said, Esther, this is your moment. You've got to go to the king and you've got to say, stop this. And Esther said, you've got to be kidding me, because if I go to the king and he doesn't send for me, unless he holds out the golden scepter, it's curtains for me. And it's at this part of the story that we have the whole crux of Esther, and I want to just work through several verses here because it's about the providence of God. It's about what God is doing in lives when we don't know and what we should do, which is to trust the Lord even when it doesn't look like things are going our way. So in Esther 4, Mordecai told them to reply to Esther because it all, this all happened through uh, messengers. Do not think to yourself that in the king's palace you will escape any more than all the Jews. Your Jewishness is going to be revealed and you're going to get it too. For if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the, for, for the Jews from another place. God is able to do that. His promise indicates that God will do that. It will happen but you and your father's house will perish. No doubt about that. Mordecai is getting very theological, but this is something Esther needs to know. And I love these three words, and who knows? Mordecai, I don't know what's going to happen. I have no revelation from God. I have no assurance of what's going to happen. Who knows? I don't know, Esther, you don't know. Nobody knows whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time is this. You're here, you can, God wants you, go. Who knows? Nobody knew, but what did Esther do? Then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai, and she probably went through some heart searching. Go, gather all the Jews to be found in Susa and hold a fast on my behalf and do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. Three days. I and my young women will also fast as you do. Then I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. I don't know what God's going to do. Who knows? It might end in, 
my death, but I'm going to do what God wants me to do because God, in his providential control, is going to make it good ultimately, even though I don't know what it is. And then the story changes chapter, but uh, this is where we, everything changes. On the third day, I just love that. It's the third day. She says, I'm dead. I perish. I perish. On the third day, as good as dead, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. And when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court, who knows? She won favor in his sight. And he held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. (laughs) And the whole story changes. Esther got to make a wish. She had a banquet. Haman didn't know what was going on. He thought it was for him. And he built a gallows for Mordecai. And he wound up hanging on those gallows. And Mordecai was, and the Jews with him were spared and raised to a level level of favor. This is the feast of uh, Purim. On a personal level, Esther, as good as dead, trusted the Lord, and God's providence is beautifully seen. There's a providence over the nations as well in world affairs. You know, it's called 400 silent years, but you know from the visions of Daniel that God was at work. Babylon, Persia, then Greece, Alexander the Great came and uh, Uh, It was his empire that the Jews lived under. Sometimes the situation was pretty good, sometimes bad, really bad at times. There was a Maccabean revolt when Antiochus decided to put one of his cronies in to be the high priest of the the temple, and uh, he sacrificed unclean animals on the altar. They they worshiped Zeus. I mean, it was a terrible situation, and the Jews revolted, and for a time... uh, Israel, or at least part of it, was again theirs, Jerusalem was, but then that started to degenerate when Rome came into power, and uh, eventually Herod the Great, 40 B.C., he died in 4 B.C., just two years probably after Christ was born, Herod's in that, the, the story of Christ's birth, and then Herod's kingdom was divided among three of his sons, and then Rome replaced one of his sons with a fellow named Pontius Pilate, who was a procurator uh, of Israel. So, you've got developments that have taken place that if you didn't know, you, you, would, you would open the pages of the New Testament and say, that, that, you know, things are different, I don't quite understand. You're talking about Pharisees and Sadducees. Who were they? Those were sects among the Jews. You've got uh, synagogues, and you've got Herod, and you have tax collectors and rabbis and all all sorts of people like this. To know what goes on in between time is to see that God was doing things so that at the fullness of time, just when he wanted, Christ was going to come into into the world. Yes, Jews were squabbling among themselves. You've got the zealots who wanted political freedom. You've got the kind of the stodgy Pharisees who were legalistic evangelical, so to speak, of their day. There were Sadducees who were respectable religious people. They tried to connect with the culture. Essenes were, were the monastics that wanted to just get away from it all. But you had people who were looking for the next thing God was going to do. You've got Zechariah and Elizabeth. You've got Joseph and Mary and Simeon and Anna, and they're looking, God, what are you going to do? They were waiting, and that's the other thing about God's providence. It sometimes involves waiting, and waiting isn't a bad thing. Waiting is another way to say, God, I trust you, that you're doing it in your time and in your way, because when we get to the Old Testament, we've got, into the Old Testament, we've got a puzzle that has significant pieces missing. Matter of fact, it looks like we've got pieces that are from another puzzle, and how in the world do you fit them together? It all seems like a paradox. If you've been following us up to the end of the Old Testament and suspend what you know about the New Testament and try to live in the now, 
you see that there are seeming contradictions all over the place. The solution seems hidden. And uh, we need somebody greater than Sherlock Holmes or Hercule Poirot to, at the end of it all, put the pieces together and try to figure it out because some of them just don't seem to fit. It's really beyond us. And we've got to capture and understand that. Yes, there's anticipation, there's hope, there's trust, all of that. But, but when and what's going to happen and who, all of that is pretty much in the dark like a riddle, not intentional, but uh, it's a way for us to maybe think outside the box of our own expectations, and God has done this. So when we get to the end of the Old Testament, we have a number of uh, this or that's. A man is going to save. That's what it looks like the Old Testament said. No, God is going to save us. A king is coming. Isn't a servant, a suffering servant? We're looking for the Lord. No, Isaiah says uh, a child. The seed of the woman? Okay, which woman are we looking for? Son of Abraham? Which son is that? He's coming for Israel. Seems like the Old Testament says that. No, for all nations. It also says that. He's coming soon. Not really. Far, far away, some Old Testament texts seem to say. With a shepherd's staff, no, with a rod of anger. He's coming to judge. No, he's going to restore. When it all happens, it'll be a very bad day, the Old Testament says. And on the other hand, perhaps the greatest day ever. I know you're not scratching your head and saying, what is it? What? You know it's, it's Christ, but and He's coming, and we're going to talk about Him. It's going to be wonderful. But you can understand something of the providence of God in your own life right now. Do you know what the rest of the day holds for you? What tomorrow holds? For, I, you have plans, but do you know what's going to happen? Do you know what's going to happen next week, next year, next decade, if you live that long? Do you know? But do you know who holds that future, no matter what it is? And do you trust him? That's the kind of providence, uh, faith in the providence of God that we need to exhibit. Our life is a mystery. It is a puzzle. And you don't have all the pieces together, and I don't have all the pieces together. But God has all the pieces together. That's why the thing that we do is we trust Him. Trust and obey, you know, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus is to trust and obey. Let me give you a verse as we go on our way today. I love it when people give me a verse. Uh, this verse uh, happens to be one that applies to all of us. And it's one of those great comprehensive verses that says something wonderful about God's intentions for all of us and personalize it for you. For God has not destined us for wrath. Isn't that good to know? But to obtain salvation. I want it. How? Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Who, this is the way he made it happen, who died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Awake or asleep is another way of saying, in the body, alive here on earth, or dead and alive with him wherever he is. That's the promise that he's giving to all of us so that we can trust that and all of the little pieces of life that we can't quite understand all the detail of, we're willing to say we'll let him have all of that. It's, it's a bit of a paradox, but it's one that we have to embrace. You might think right now, I'm, uh, I'm in a fiery furnace. I'm in a lion's den. I'm in a pickle. I can't, if I make this decision this way, something bad's going to happen. If I go this way, something bad is going to happen. 
There's one thing that we need to do when we face those conundrums and puzzles and paradoxes of life. There's only one thing, and that is we've got to die. We've got to die to, just like Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Esther and Mordecai, we've got to die to our ways, our truth, we have to die to our life. It's not that we take our life. It's that we give our life. And by so doing, we die to our own self-will of it and trust the one who can. Die to self. Die daily and be alive to God. Next week, we're going to talk about Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And now, we're going to sing about him, and words, we're going to encourage you to have them come from your mouth, but the question is, are they the reflection of our heart? And I just hope that in thinking about the great God and his great providence, and the examples we have in Daniel and Esther, you say, I want to be of that number. Let's stand and let's sing.
trust and hope and pray that no matter what you might be going through and what you're facing today, that that is your prayer and that is your desire to follow Jesus. And as we learn from Daniel and Esther, God is sovereign, God is guiding, God is protecting. Sometimes there might be waiting, sometimes there might be silence, but God is always at work and we can trust him and trust who he is and trust what he's doing in our lives. So next week we will continue on in the one story as we turn the pages from the Old Testament to the New. We hope that you will come back and join us then. Reminder of the welcome gathering and lunch is served right now as you head on out. Enjoy the rest of your Memorial Day weekend. God bless you all. You are dismissed.